We're continuing on during this Lenten season of the year of the Eucharist to speak about the Eucharist and the Mass. And last week we saw how the Eucharist, our greatest gift, has some remarkable effects on us when we receive it in Holy Communion. It has the same effects that on our soul that bread and wine have on our body. Remember, just as bread nourishes the body and wine brings delight, so too Holy Communion nourishes our soul and brings joy. And specifically, Holy Communion preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace. It forgives our venial sins and strengthens us to avoid future sins, and it is a foretaste of heaven. Holy Communion can do all these things because it is truly Jesus, hidden under the appearances of bread and wine, but truly him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Jesus, the source of all grace and the author of all life, is received into our hearts. And since this is the case, we can ask ourselves, as we concluded last week, why am I not yet a saint if I have received Holy commun Communion so many times in my life? Well, clearly, the limitation is not on the side of Jesus, right? He is deficient and lacking in nothing. And when, it comes, when he comes to us in Holy Communion, uh, he gives us everything. The issue, then, is on our end. It is not the one who receive, is not the one who gives, but the one who receives that is lacking. So imagine this for a moment. Five people go down to the river to fetch water, and they all come back with different amounts, some more and some less. Why is that? I asked that question to our kids at, at school mass, and they all stared at me with blank stares. So I'll just tell you the answer very simply. <laughs> they had different sized containers, right? Maybe someone brought a thimble, another person a cup, another person a quart, another person a five gallon bucket. Maybe someone brought their tractor and a 50 gallon drum, right? And they all came away with different amounts of water. They didn't, the, the, the river had enough water to fill whatever they brought. They won't run out. So it was a matter of what they brought. So too in Holy Communion, we receive according to what we are disposed to receive. I might receive only a little teaspoon, while the person next to me might receive gallons and gallons. Same Jesus, different results. The issue here is one of quality, not quantity. It's not whoever receives communion the most times becomes the holiest. That's not the case. If that were the case, then canonizing a saint would be very easy. All we'd have to do is count up how many times did they go to communion. But that's not the case. And one communion is enough to make a person a saint. There's enough grace in one communion to make a person a saint. And we actually have an example of that, a little girl named Blessed Imelda Lambertini. I won't share her story because of the time, but uh, she received her first and only communion before she was transported to the realms of heaven. So it's a matter of quality, not quantity. To improve the quality of our communions, we need to increase our disposition. And to increase our disposition, there are two things that we need to focus on. Our preparation before communion and our thanksgiving after communion. Our preparation for, before, a couple of practical things. To receive communion, we need to have fasted. This means no food or drink except water and medicine for at least one hour before Holy Communion. Not before Mass, but before Holy Communion, which can be a moving target, depending on how long I talk, depending on whether we have music, depending on whether it's Lent or ordinary time. So you want to give yourself lots of room there. And the exception to this rule is for those who are elderly and sick and those who take care of them. I knew a physician who insisted that, okay, if you're older and you're, you're weak, you need to eat something before you come to Mass so you don't faint. But the reason for doing this, the reason for the fast, is to focus our intention on what we are about to do. That way, we start to think of it an hour before it happens. Okay, I better stop eating here because I'm about to go to a communion. This is very important. Another practical consideration is how we present ourselves at Mass. The Catechism says bodily demeanor, such as gestures and clothing, 
ought to convey the respect, solemnity, and joy of this moment when Christ becomes our guest. Now, if we were going to meet someone very important, we would dress up and we'd act all proper, stand up straight and everything. Well, Jesus is our divine guest who comes to us in Holy Communion. So it's not for me to judge what people wear, but you sh- it's something for all of us to think about. In our first reading, God commanded Moses to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. We don't have to take off our shoes at Mass, but we too are on holy ground here. In addition to these simple things, we should consider the state of our souls. Again, the Catechism says this, anyone conscious of a grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. And this is something that comes straight from the New Testament. St. Paul says very clearly in his first letter to the Corinthians that those who receive in an unworthy manner eat and drink judgment upon themselves and profane the body and blood of the Lord. And we call this sacrilege. As I said last week, food is only good for the living. And the spiritual food of the Eucharist can only benefit those who have the life of charity in their souls. So we should take these, these warnings seriously and just think about how we stand spiritually. And if we are aware of some serious sin, we should refrain from coming to Holy Communion until we have made a good confession. Likewise, if you are living in an irregular state, then we should talk and see how to resolve this. In the meantime, also refrain from coming to Communion. What do I mean by an irregular state? Well, this could mean a lot of things, and it could depend on the person. So if anybody has any questions, we can talk about this privately. But two common ones that come up very frequently, and oftentimes people have questions about are being married outside the church and living together before communion, or before marriage, I mean. Once these things have been resolved, or once you have gone to the sacrament of reconciliation, then we should focus on God's love in the sacrament of the Eucharist, not so much on our sins. We should turn away from those things as long as we have confessed them. As one saint said, turn your face up to the sunshine to receive its warmth and its light and not to the ground, to look for the shadows of ourselves when we block out the sunshine. We should focus on what God wants from us and how he loves us so much that he gave us this great Eucharist to receive. And Jesus also gave us the sacrament of reconciliation to prepare us for Holy Communion. We know this because at the Last Supper, before he gave the apostles their first communion, what did he do? He washed their feet. The desire of his sacred heart is that we should receive the Eucharist so that we might have life. To Jesus, it is all about us. He wants to come to us. Immediately before receiving Holy Communion, we should try to banish from our hearts anything that is not from God and increase our desire to receive Jesus there so that we may advance in God's love. And we could say certain prayers. There's prayers in the Missalette. You could make up prayers of your own. You could say certain Hail Marys or Glory Bees or whatever you want as you're preparing to come up to Communion. In the Missal that I use at Mass, The priest, it has specified prayers that I am supposed to say each time before I receive communion. And I pray those silently um, before before that. And then when we come up to communion, there are different ways we can receive, either standing or kneeling in our hands or on our tongues. The preference of the church's tradition is to receive Holy Communion on the tongue because it is a greater symbol of the fact that we are being fed, that Jesus the Good Shepherd is feeding us his sheep and we are not taking food for ourselves. We think about how at a wedding, the, the bride and the groom at their reception, they oftentimes take pieces of cake and feed each other, right? Because that's an important moment. Well, this is an important moment when Jesus, the bridegroom of our souls, feeds us with himself. And so we should you know, come forward and receive communion in a very careful way. Then after receiving Holy Communion, we should return to our pew, kneel down and pray. The Eucharistic presence in our bodies remains for about 15 minutes, and these minutes are so precious. It's one of the reasons why we shouldn't just receive communion and walk out the door. 
This happened once to St. Philip Neri when someone did that, and he sent two of the altar boys with candles to follow that person to their home um, because the Eucharistic presence is still with us. And we call this time our thanksgiving, and we can fill it with prayers and acts of faith, hope, and love. We should be astonished that God's love knows no limits, even to the point of becoming our food. And once again, we can say certain prayers, and those can be very simple, or they can be longer prayers. There is another prayer that I pray silently um, at the, after communion, and it goes like this. Hopefully I can remember it. What is past our lips as food, O Lord, may we receive in purity of heart, that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. That's what I say after communion, and you can have your own prayers too. I, I read one recently that went like this. My God, for the love of this, your Son, whom I have in, within my heart, give me your love and make me all yours. Something simple like that. If we can make a good preparation before communion, and a good thanksgiving after, then our reception of Holy Communion will, will bear more fruit. We will grow in love of God, and we will grow in love for others, and we will become saints. And this is the fruit that the Lord will come in search of, like the person who planted a fig tree in today's gospel. Please, God, when he comes, may he find fruit in us. If not, let us cultivate the ground of our lives and fertilize it so that it may bear fruit and not be cut down.